It's Wednesday. Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. Why fly time? We're back. We are back. And I'm feeling a lot better than last week. Last week I was pretty tired. You were. You were trying to take a nap <laughs> in the I, office before we got I started. I took a nap beforehand. And, <laughs> it happens. Uh, it didn't work. But that trip to Cuba, I was still recovering. Well, rightfully so. Too you, much you had a You had a time. Good uh, times are, are pretty time. cool. So. We are super excited for tonight. Super excited. Wednesday. I, lo- I mean, it's always fun to have the guys tie really big flies. Yes. So I know what to put in my musky box for, for this year. You know, it's kind of, that's secretly what this is all about. So I, <laughs> for I me. I totally so. agree. I think Eddie was fishing some of his flies this fall when I was fishing with him. Yeah. So pretty exciting. Uh, do we have any announcements before we introduce our guest, Brian? Right, the know. Michigan Fly Fishing Club show coming up. Oh, yeah. That's uh, right. That's Macomb Community College in Warren, Michigan. That's, uh, I believe it's March 13th and 14th. So I know Eli is going to be there. We were talking about that a little bit ago. And we're looking forward to hopefully having a great turnout for the Michigan Fly Fishing Club show. And then, yeah, he's a featured tire down there. He is a featured tire. So if you like what you see here, you can come check him out. Maybe pick up some of his flies. Always a good idea. Always a good idea. We have the Fly Fishing Film Tour coming up uh, at the City Opera House Saturday, March 5th. If you're new to this, welcome. If this is your first live fly tying session, welcome. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Use the comment section down below. That's that's the whole idea of this, is you get to talk to professional yes. guides, professional tires, and... Somebody just referred to us as gentlemen. Yeah, that was... That was so kind of you. That was Thank you, nice. Mr. Thank Fraser. you. Yeah. We appreciate Keep it up. That. Keep up the good work. <laughs> all right. Let's... Uh, I'll, uh, hey, I'll click the buttons if you want to introduce Eli here. There we go. There he is. He's on screen. All right, Eli. He may be frozen right now. Maybe frozen. It's just a picture of him, really. So it's Uh (laughs) hopefully we get him back. (laughs) We've been uh, we've been forcing the internet issue tonight. So uh oh. Let's see. Maybe maybe we can get him back. Well, that's okay. We have plenty of other announcements we can talk about. So we just can you believe uh, the film tour? is less than a month away. I'm so excited for that. I'm very excited for a Saturday night. So if you want to come on, on up, have a fun weekend, uh, do a little steelhead fishing, do a little winery tour, maybe a brewery tour. Yeah. Um, bring friends, significant other, whatever. Have fun. Have fun. So, all right, we have we have Eli back in the green room. Let's try this again. There yeah, he is. There we go. He's crispy, too. I like that sharp image. You're on screen, sir. Welcome. Can you hear us? Maybe. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Can you hear us? Oh, there's always something. Always something. Just has muted themselves. Uh-oh. All right. Hopefully we can get this fixed here. There he is. There you are. <laughs> can you hear us? All right. I, I apologize, man. It's the it's the life of the internet in the woods. In the, no in worries. The sticks. That's all right. Can you hear us just Oops. fine there? Eli? There we go. I'm gonna switch. I us. got you. I got there it. we go. Perfect. That's the screen I want. Well, what are, we're tying up some musky flies tonight. Uh, I thought you guys want to do bluegill bugs. Yeah, blue I thought ice fishing, right? Ice fishing. No, Russ yeah. already did ice fishing bugs. You know that's kind of his thing. So. <laughs> So we welcome Eli Barrett from Great Lakes Fly tonight. Welcome, Eli. How Glad long have you been? Here. How long you been doing this, Eli? Uh, the Great Lakes Fly thing. I think I started it in two thousand and eight. Okay. Think. But yeah. tying much longer than that. Sure. How many How many flies do you um, figure that you send out a year? Well, a couple years ago, I started keeping a tally of how many flies I tie in a year. That's any fly that comes off my vice, whether it's for me, whether it's going for a customer, whether it's going for a buddy. And I think the last two years, I've come in just under 2,000 flies have come off my vice a year. Oh, my gosh. That is quite a feat. Already at 275 for this year. Wow. And we're just like into February. 
I don't think yeah. I've tied more than a few dozen at the most. I don't know. I've been way behind this year. I am I've been definitely behind. Too busy time. with stuff, so that's how it goes. I need to get after it. So well, how'd you, you end up? Somebody. Say that again. You got somebody to chase now. That's right. <laughs> so has it always been big musky flies for you? Has it? You know, where did your tying start? So I started. Um, I think uh, I was like 15 or something, and my mom got me a like a I think it was a shamrock at the time, the shamrock uh, fly tying kit, and that's what I started tying a woolly bug or woolly worm. Um, and then she said, if you like that, then we'll get you a fly rod for your birthday. My birthday's in June, so uh, I got like the the Cortland like starter firefly kit or whatever for a fly rod, and then it kind of took off from there. So it started with you know pond bass flies. Um, and trout stuff. I wanted to do the trout, but I live in Metro Detroit. So uh, as a 15 year old kid, you can't really go very close to get a, to get a, uh, a trout. So I, you know, did the best I could with bass and then kind of grew into, you know, going after trout uh, as I got into late, you know, teenage years and early twenties. And then uh, as most guys will tell you and who tie the streamers is they found this book modern trophy or modern streamers for trophy trout and it like blew my mind and uh i started getting after it tying trout flies but again i never fish for trout um you know maybe once or twice a year i get up you know up northern michigan to fish for trout mostly by foot which isn't really the best by uh for streamers so then i just started a angle towards lake st Clair uh because it's you know and, and uh then I fell in love with trying to chase uh, salmon and brown trout on the shores of Lake Michigan, uh, trying to do the the rust thing there. Sure. And uh, I started to, to, to really experiment with the East Coast tying techniques of tying bigger flies. Um, got into it. It's such a hit and miss. Like you got to like strike lightning in order to uh, to yes, make it happen do. doing that stuff. And we it, it, it figured a couple times, but. Then I was like, hey, I can take these same techniques and start driving it towards bass and, and, and musky and pike. And I did that. And then in 2009, I met uh, through Matt Gryeski because Matt and I were part of an online fly tying, fly tying forum and uh, talk fly fishing websites. And uh, he introduced me to his brother who lived in Metro Detroit. And Eric and I went out musky fishing for the first time, fly fishing. And the first time we were out there, he caught a musky on one of my flies that I gave him. And uh, it kind of snowballed from there. That's awesome. That is a great That's story. That's a great that story. That's a fantastic story. <laughs> That's cool, man. I think we all got into the, the whole streamer thing there, um, you know, with Popovics. And, you know, there's so many good East Coast stuff. Uh, Sadati, mm-hmm. um, you know. Doc, just, or scope. Yeah. Yep. I definitely scope. checked that Kelly's book out. I don't know how many times. It just. I think the library got tired of it. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> well, so what are we tying tonight? Yeah. Uh, I am going to tie one of the flies. I've got a handful of flies that I'm probably most known for, um, but probably the one that everybody knows the most from me is the Optimus Swine. The Optimus um, Swine, yes. Yeah. And uh, it's a fly that uh, its design, uh, it kind of came into its own through accident. Um, I was... You know, all the pike and musky flies to that point that I'd seen had this heavy epoxy head, right? And yes. all I was trying to do is trying to figure a way to make a fly fall slower in the water column, right? And uh, so I said, I got this, this foam popper head thing. Let me slide this somewhere in the body. And I wound up, you know, putting it in there and it did exactly what I wanted it to. And there was, a, I was out with Eric Grasky again, uh, fishing uh, for bass. And I showed him, like, hey, look what I came up with. He's like, well, throw it on and see what happens. First cast, just to see the motion, the, the fly moves side to side, and a muskie came behind it, took a Shut swipe at off. it. And then, <laughs> and then uh, he goes, he goes, well, throw it out there again. So I threw it out there again, and bam, second cast, I got it. And it was, it was small. It was probably 30, 32 inches. But the first cast with the Optimus Swine in the water <laughs> oh uh, actually gosh. raised a muskie, and the second one got it. Oh my gosh, that is awesome! And it immediately went on the wall to the to the retired fly wall. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. We all we all have that. Wall I run that home. program. Yeah, I do too. It's been kind of barren in the past year or so, but 
<laughs> I just added a, a crab fly to mine. <laughs> nice. We, so how long ago would you say the Optimus swine came into play? That was 2011, I think. Okay. 2010, 2011. It's just really interesting so, for me because 10, I've, 11, I've followed, you know, I've, I remember seeing that fly for the first time and just – it was kind of before I got into pike fishing, and since then I've I follow a lot of what some of the European guys do too for pike. You know, I mean, I I understand the frustration with commercially tied pike flies, and it's just you know you got your your bunny strip and your epoxy head, and that's about it. And and they work, they do, but sometimes it's more fun to fish a big bright fly and something that moves. It's funny. I saw in the past two, three years, some of them have started to do this popper in the body thing. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I feel like I've seen this before, you know, <laughs> you know, maybe a few years ago, maybe even from a Michigan guy, which I thought was really cool that that kind of has made it across the pond to some of those guys who, who catch some really big pike on that fly. For sure. So I'm excited to see this. So. All right, so I'm going to tie it in the in the Mardi Gras version again. Probably the one I'm probably most famous for is this Mardi Gras black, pink, and chartreuse. Um, and I was watching the video with Matt, and one of the things that Matt likes to do, and I, I was, with a lot of sarcastic banter, uh, is scalability. And so I started with the regular, that big, you know, Optimus Swine, which runs in. Runs a half to well, we may have lost Eli there. That's okay. He's nine and I'm a half sure. inches. Oh, there he is. There we go. There he oh. is. All right, I saw it for a this time, so I paused. <laughs> yeah, but uh, scalability is a big thing. And uh, so being able to, you know, have the regular one at like seven and a half to nine inches. I've got the Swine Junior, which I use a smaller popper head for, which you can get down to like five and a half to seven inches. Good pike. Great smallmouth fly. Uh, Pre-spawn when they're really on the feed bag really cuts out the, uh, the smaller fish and you can really target the bigger ones. And then last year I kind of found a way to make it a little bit smaller. And uh, I'll have this at the Midwest show this year. It's the uh, the pot belly swine. So we got the swan, the Optimus swine, the uh, Optimus swine junior, and now the pot belly swine, which I'm using those Chacon uh, foam strips yes. in there for my foam as a popper head, so I don't close off that hook gap, and it's working pretty well. Um, and then there's also some rumors out there. Uh, I've heard people talk about it, that there's a, a Maximus swine. Uh, that's the articulated version and our Maximus Swine Jr. that I may have a little few of those hanging around at the show too. Um, those have done performed very well uh, across the Michigan pond and uh, over in Wisconsin. Those have done very well for uh, for muskie over there. Fantastic, awesome. So, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I like to tie this fly on a mustad spinnerbait hook. This is a six ot, uh, the thirty two six zero eight. You can't like I, a lot of guys will ask for, and I will accommodate that of using a Gamagatsu spinnerbait hook in the five ot, which the Gami five ot is like between the Mustad five ot and the the six ot, so it's almost like a like a five and a half ot if you if you were to go to the Mustad sizes. So it works pretty good, keeps about the same size and platform. Um, I tie the rattle off the back of this fly, and I use the rubber spider collars. And the plastic rattles that have the the little nubbin on them, and we get those in there. And I cut off that tag. Okay. Okay. To about yeah. a quarter of an inch, and I'll tie it right off the back, nice and snug. And again, I tie backwards. Deal with it. No comments about it will be put up on the video. So. <laughs> I I've had people like come to like when we used to do live tying things in shops and people would be like, I'm sorry, I couldn't pay attention. You're tying backwards. I'm like, all right. I think, <laughs> oh you're, being, I, I think you're being a little dramatic. Are you so, naturally left-handed? No, I'm right-handed. I just, 
I just, okay, so that same Shamrock fly tying kit I learned out of a book. Sure. Never watched anybody do it pre-YouTube, right? I just right. did it, and that's how I did it. And it's hard-coded, and it can't be undone. I like it. So next I'm going to start working in the the tail section, which is a synthetic I mix myself of Syniac and Polar, Fi- or Polar Flash. Ooh. And I'm going to take that bunch. I got it tied up in these big hanks. I'm going to take that bunch. I'm going to split it right down the middle. I'm going to take one of those ends. And then I always like to, you know, never like those that straight edge on any bait fish fly because bait fish don't have a straight edge. So I'll always tease that out. All right, get a nice loose item there. And I'll set that over just about to cover up the rattle. Not that I think that means anything, but I just think that makes the best uh, balance. I'll do a couple lashes here. So I got one of those down. I'm going to flip it. I'm going to add the chartreuse on the bottom. I'm going to do the same thing. And I found the flash that I mix in this stuff is the opal color of the polar flash. And that really mixes really well and takes on the colors that it's in. I could see that. How'd you end up using this this material? I mean, it's such a unique... Um, well, I don't even know where I found I, I found it through... Uh, um, a fly shop, an East Coast fly shop when I was learning all that, that, uh, stuff, the, um, Bears Den in Massachusetts is the place that I picked it up from. Um, and they were the only place that could get it. Then, then I couldn't get the colors from them anymore. And I had to go on a, uh, a endless search on the internet to find, try and find out what the real thing is, because all synthetics and fly tying were never intended for fly tying, right? They just find their way there. Sure. Right. And so I'm like, it's got to have some other use. So I found out what it is, and it's wig hair, and uh, I was found some good sources for it, and I'm able to buy it in bulk, and then I mix it up myself with nice. the colors. So. Can't believe you gave that away. My guy's I mean, down in uh, my guy's down okay. in New Orleans. Go to the wig shops and get their materials. <laughs> so you say that, Matt, but remember, none of these things were intended for fly tying. It's true. So, the more I talk about them, the more people ask for them, and the more people can get them, right? Staying power is everything. We saw that a few years ago with one of the chenilles uh, from Hairline that the producer was not wanting to do it anymore because it's only the only people that use their fly tires anymore. So, yeah, I remember hearing There's about that. There's that, and then um, what was the other stuff? So there was a really cool bait fish uh, material that used to be out there uh, called DNA. Yeah, I remember that. And- and the DNA hollow fusion, it was awesome. Um, then it went away and then some other company picked it up and brought it back and now it's gone again. And, uh, I, there's probably some materials you like, especially if they're synthetics, you gotta, you gotta use them and promote them or else they're going to go away. That's crazy. What thread so are you I have using? a super, super crazy fit fly tying tool, an empty pen case that I'm going to use to push the stuff back. And I just kind of break it over the, hook point and push that back just like that and the thread i'm using is the utc 210 or 280 sorry and uh i like to use these midge bobbins one thing that you guys who tie streamers might you know if your guys are breaking bobbins, try switching to one of these midge bobbins, the small three-inch ones. They don't bend as much and flex, so they're probably not going to break as much on the welds. So that makes that's sense. A, uh, I love them. I love getting my fingers right in in there, so I can you know not playing far away. I'm I'm right in there putting the thing together, and that's what these big flies are so much. Is it's not so much time you're putting them together. Yep. Yeah, you're building something. Exactly. So I've got my second piece of the pink here. I'm going to lay on the top. And again, I'm going to put a little bit off the back there. 
So I get asked every once in a while when people talk to me about bobbins, like, well, how many bobbins do you break a year? I know, Matt, one of the things you said is, like, I talked about the table rock when I'm rocking, when I'm tying the flies. And, you know, with all that torque, I've never broken a, a weld on a bobbin. With as hard as I torque on these flies, I've never done it. I've seen you so torque, might, and it's like, woo. I might break the thread, but I, I've never broken a bobbin. I've had the ceramic break if I drop it or something, but I've yeah. never broken a weld. I've gone we'll through a same. few of the right bobbins, but a uh, little bit of Loctite super glue or whatever works just fine. The uh, titanium uh, midge bobbin, I think it is from uh, Dr. Slick's pretty good. The best bobbins they don't make anymore, which is the peewee bobbins from Griffin. Those ones are the best. I have an alert set on eBay. Whenever anybody puts one up, I buy every single one they have to go <laughs> every single time. You sound like Alex and Musky Bates. Yep. <laughs> Who else was talking about? Oh, and Russ's Russ's whip finisher yeah, too. The Matt- Mattarelli whip <laughs> finisher. We know what we like as tires, don't we? I like oh, that yeah. Griffin Magnum. I use that a lot. That Magnum bobbin is perfect. Bad. That's not, not bad. bad. It's I a mean, small, it's a smaller one too. All right. So I put my second set of that Cyniac down. I've got my long synthetic tail that doesn't hold any water, right? I'm going to trim that up a little bit. I just like to drag the scissors along it so it's not straight. I'm just kind of cutting it as we go. And now I've got my base of my fly, right? So um, the next thing I want to do is I'm going to lay down my internal flash on my, my tail. So use on the regular size Optimus Swine. I like to use the Magnum. Uh, Flashaboo. In this case, I got the Pearl Chartreuse. And one thing that uh, I like to do in these types of demonstrations is show those little tips and tricks, right? So about the bobbin. But another thing that I do on my flash, whether it be this Magnum or just your standard, you know, Flashaboo, is on the standard Flashaboo, if you've ever had your lost half a hank of flash because it all fell apart because you used half of it. I take goop and I cover that end with goop. It'll never fall apart. You'll be able to use every single piece before that it comes off that end. I, I need to do and that. I use, That's brilliant. And I, <laughs> I re- use uh, I re zip tie, out. but I haven't done the goop. Sally hmm. Hansen, I use on this right next to the zip tie. And like you get it out like that so it dries and doesn't get on it. But then now I'm not going to have this fall apart. That's ideal. I mean, not as a One fly those... shop. As guys that run fly shops, you probably didn't want me talking about that, but no, we we like that. We like that. So, Nobody likes. I'm going to take my, my healthy amount of flash, right? Uh, I think I read in Barry Reynolds' original Pike fly, on the Fly Book that you can always add, or you can't add any more flash to a fly, but you can always cut it out, right? So always Absolutely. add as much flash as you think you'll need. With that being said, I don't think I've ever cut flash out of a fly, so I must not be using it enough. So I just kind of even it out, and I'm going to go right down each flank. Now I've got my flash that's going to go under my my saddles on each side. And now I'm going to pick out my saddles. For this one, I'm going to use a, a pink uh, grizzly on the side here. This is an American rooster saddle. Um, from Whiting, I think they're they're probably my favorite for the uh, for the Optimus Swine. They're just the perfect profile, and I'll pick two at a time. I use four feathers total, so I usually pick a pair, and then I split them right. So I'll pick two that are almost identical, and then I'll put one in one pile for one side and one pile one in pile for the other. And I'll do the same thing for the other side. And now I've got my my feathers there. And I'll take those and I'll pair them up. And I want to get them to the point where I'm going to run my finger. And right where that bend starts to go, right there, that's where I want to tie it in. I don't want to put too much of that stiff part of the feather on there because that's not going to move. 
You're trying to get as much movement out of this as you can. You want it like it, so it, it depends on who's using it and where, right? So like if it's a river fly, you got that pause, you've got those currents that are gonna push it, and you want it to move and dance in the current when it's on the pause there. Um, and then on the when it's in still water in a lake, you really get the movement, the side to side movement on this fly. And that'll make that, you know, those those feathers kind of splay out and do whatever you want. So it kind of does acts a little bit different depending on what type of water you're fishing in. It's interesting too. Uh, with I've noticed this. I'm sure you have as well, Eli. Is that the grizzly American saddles are are different? They're kind of a different makeup. Some a lot of times than your regular solid colors. Oh yeah, they they're, they have yeah. way they're longer and more of a more of a taper to them. They're a little bit thinner, which bums me out because I would love to see them and see them in that long length in the solid colors. Yeah. Um. And it just, you know, just the, it's just, it's got to be from demand from, you know, the folks that want the genetic of the, uh, of the grizzlies. Cause they, you know, they must sell way more grizzlies than they do, uh, than they do the stand, than the solids. So just how the genetics worked on it. So I'm going to take, yep. now that I've got my tail built, I've got my feathers on each side. I'm going to tie this off. Now I not gonna not gonna dig on rust, but I'll never lose my uh, my whip finisher. <laughs> so I'm surprised I'm Russ even uses a whip finisher. I am too. <laughs> For on most of the purpose, just above that, and I'm gonna add my popper head, and it's got that cavity in the back. I use the Rainey's Mini Me Mediums for the regular, the musky size, right? I use the smalls for the juniors, and then, like I mentioned, I use that chacon foam for the uh, for the for the pot bellies. And I'm going to take that gap, that that cavity in there, and I'm going to fill it with uh, just goop, silicone goop. Nice. I like the goop too the best. Um, the regular goop's pretty good, but this stuff I think uh, it lasts the longest as far as it, it stays pliable, and then it but it doesn't run like it's, it's a good combination. And then I'll take that and I'm going to slide that on the hook and I'll tell you anybody who has done a tying class with me, uh, this is very, very dangerous because it gets stuck. And then when it goes, you can drive your finger right into your thumb or your thumb right into the, the point of the hook there. So I'm going to slide that on. And that is the base. Now when I'm production tying I'll this is what I do. And then I'm going to take this off and I'm going to throw it in a bin and I'm just going to keep doing it and I'll do all the bucktail part later. So I'll do like half of it. I'm going to put my thread back on. I'm going to push back on that a little bit just to kind of lock it into place. And now it's time for bucktail. So I am not a lot of, I get the question a lot when I tie, um, you know, do I reverse tie bucktail? And I do not. I tie bucktail in straight on and back. And what I really like, I kind of like a bucktail that is, that has its deer hair qualities, right? That you can really bite into with the thread. So I've got a, this is a really, I really like, this is a solid pink bucktail here. That's got a lot of fibers like that. So usually uh, most of the of the bucktail I use on musky flies comes in the bottom, like I don't know, like two thirds. But this one I might be able to use all the way to the tip. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pinch off a section here, and I've got it to the point. I've done so many of these, right, that every single time I've got the same amount of bucktail. So it's usually about a sixteenth of an inch wide by about a quarter of an inch tall when I'm pinching it in my fingers like that. So you're well, basically like a pencil size. Um, I guess when I when I'm not pinching it anymore, it's about half a pencil. Perfect. I can't do fractions. So that, I can barely do math. <laughs> <laughs> Look at your beads, right? The beads all <laughs> right. come in their size. 
And so I pinch it so it's like so it's like straight up and down. And then I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna put it on the hook, and you're gonna watch half of it go one way and half of it go the other. I'm gonna take a couple lashes here, nice and loose, and almost like you're tying a bucktail, right? And or tying deer hair, and just do a couple to cinch it on, and there we go. All right. There's oh, that first yeah. piece. And it kind of flares out and it covers uh, a little more than half of the hook. So it's going to start to come around the bottom of the hook, but we don't want it to go all the way around. So I'll flip it on the other side here. I'll grab a section of chartreuse. And I'm going to do that same system. Lash that on. And I'm not very, like, I say this all the time, that I'm not very OCD when it comes to fly tying, um, but I kind of am, <laughs> sure. right? So, like, like I was telling you guys how messy my, my tying room is, but that doesn't bother me, but how the stuff goes on. And in most cases, right, I like to put five sections of bucktail on top and bottom on a, on a big Optimus swine like this. But... I will tell anybody who's tying it for the first time or learning how to tie with bucktail, don't get hung up on how many sections you put on that thing. Do what fits on the platform you've got. So if you're tying and it's, it's a little sloppy, that's okay. You're not going to tie like someone like me or Matt who literally puts, you know, it'd be it's a good thing PETA doesn't find out how many bucktails go through our garbage can, right? So, like, right. Uh, it's, uh, you know, They're just the perfect amount on the platform. I'm going to take another one on the bottom here. Got that one there. I'll do another pink on top here. Just moving up a little bit each time. Not overcrowding them, not putting them on top of each other. Just advancing enough to lay the next one down, and they're not really getting on top of each other. I'll take my thumb and I'll work that around. And you're not worried about gluing these or doing any sort of thing at this point? No. No. The only ones that I kind of. Uh, one of the flies that I tie, the bingo, I tie with um, a mono thread, another one of those things I picked up from the East Coast. And uh, I'm a little paranoid about those getting hit with a tooth and falling apart, although I've never had a single person, or I've, I've never had it happen myself, or had somebody else come up to me and say, this fly came apart on me. Right. So, sure. It's just more paranoia than anything. I'm a paranoid fly tire. I'll admit it. There was a thing. I go through a lot of zap. Ross and I used to say, are you paranoid? Or are you not paranoid enough? <laughs> <laughs> I liked I liked Tom's probably the best from last year. He's not superstitious. He's semi-stitious. Semi-stitious. <laughs> sort of uh, stitious. We all have our own little nuances, right? That's right. In this industry. Yeah. Well, I'm getting out, so I've got a little bit of space left. I've got enough space left for two more tie-ins of bucktail. So this is where I'm going to put it in my flash. So I'm going to put it on the bottom first. And this is the same color flash that we used before? Nope, I'm going to alternate that. All depends. Like, I'm going to finish this fly off pretty much with black on the head. So I'm going to add some black flash and some pink flash here. Right on go back to the the magnum flashaboo but in black hollow this time I like to mix the colors up you know if I put the one flash in the tail I usually usually don't put it up front depending on if it's a more natural type of fly I might do that but this is not So I've got that laid down. 
And now I'm going to add some crystal flash on top of it. Give that dual texture. Two right? textures, sure. This is going to be pink. I mean, even for a given pattern, like the Mardi Gras, I'm, I don't have a specific recipe where this has got to be the chartreuse pearl, this has got to be black, this has got to be pink. Sometimes it's pink back here, sometimes it's, you know, the chartreuse crystal flash. You know, I just kind of mix it up. And now I'm going to start working in that black. And what's amazing is on these flies, right? Like, it looks like this now, but you add that first piece of black. It changes the fly look, totally. And it's just one little little section. It kind of sets an edge. All about the contrast. Yep. Already starting to see it, right? Oh, yeah, that looks good. So now I'm going to flip it, and I'm getting ready to finish. So... Normally, like here's one of those OCD things. You know, it's not really a big deal until it's a big deal. That I always want my last tie-in on a fly to be on the top, right? So now the way that I've done it, I've got to flip it over without tying on the top first. And I'm going to add in some black down here. And... You know, one of the things that you can't really see on this video that I do is when I've laid that that down is how the like the release of that bucktail, like as I was like starting to tie it on, how you kind of let it go and it kind of springs around the fly or on the around the hook shank. Um, that's just one of those things you get that feel for of laying that bucktail down. Yeah, there's definitely a special feel when it comes to bucktail and deer hair, anything like that, that you develop. I mean, it takes some experience. Time. Yeah. I have, I, I mean, I can't do, I can barely do spun deer hair. I can spin deer hair. I can't stack it, right? Like I can spin right. a, a head for a, for a, for one of my flies that I use, that I do called the Chunka Monk. Uh, it's a, you know, Buford style. And I've gotten way better at that. But man, if I try and make like a, a good bass bug. Don't talk to me because I'm pretty grumpy. <laughs> I'm gonna add this that, last. That's definitely an here. art to itself. For sure. I'm gonna bring that around. Uh, I do see the comment. I just I haven't been paying attention to too many comments, but somebody just asked about the uh, about the mono thread. thread. Yep. Depends on the on the fly and the bingos. The bigger musky flies use the point zero point uh, zero eight, and on the like my more my flies more like the uh, the, the the lake trout, salmon, brown trout, like big lake flies. I use the point zero six. So Thanks. I've got that set up. I could, you know, put eyes on this thing, and it's a musky fly right now, right? Like I could, I could do that. But I'm gonna finish it off with a Senyo laser dub on the head, and I take. It's gonna wind up being four clumps, and I'll take that clump and I'll try and just pull the edges out, all the loose edges out, and keep putting it towards the middle. And I'm gonna stack that on top here. Do a couple lashes. And then do the same thing on the bottom. And what's nice about this stuff, too, is you get really good contrast. Like, one of the things I've been doing lately is, like, for, like, a bloody sucker or any of the natural colors, um, you can put, like, where I'm going to put a piece in right now, you can put, like, red. And then when you advance it a little bit, put, like, a lighter color, a tan or a white. And you get like that translucent, like gill plate color. Gil like it's plate. really cool how it looks. I'm add one here. It seems like everybody in the Great Lakes uses this for a head. 
It's I, good love I, mean, it's a, I love that stuff. Fantastic material until you get a bad bag of it that's not long. Like I've gotten stuff where the old fibers were less than a half an inch, and I just had to throw it right in the garbage. I'm like, yep. come on. I've tried to force it a few times. To just yeah, I have. I had too. a bag of yellow that way. I remember. Oh, yellow, yellow, pink. Um, it's usually the lighter colors that are like that. Yep. So I've got that set there, right? So I've got that first piece, and a couple things too. One of the nice things about tying on these bigger platforms is, then you can't do this on a small fly. Is that you can always make room if you need to, right? So you get a good grip, you take that head, and you kind of just work it back a little bit. And I can grab a little bit extra room if I need it, right at the front. So I'll flip That's that part over. of the advantage of not throwing glue down every single That's layer. That's true. <laughs> good point, Matt. I mean, who hasn't glued their fingers together while tying a fly? Me. I, I do it all the time. Well, I have, yeah. <laughs> I remember uh, when my oldest son was young, he came down here on the on the bench when I my be- tying room in the basement, and he grabbed something off of my bench, and I didn't know what he had, and he put it in his mouth, and it had uh, clear cure goo on it, like oh uncured. Oh my gosh. Cured- and uh yeah i was like worried to have to call poison control he's like it's hot it's hot it's hot uh <laughs> oh, no. got, got him a little milk and uh i think five minutes later we were okay but i told him like don't put it why you put that in your mouth <laughs> i used to take my son when he was a toddler over to ross's apartment and you know there's fly tied Stuff just everywhere, right? Razor blades for cutting deer hair and trimming deer hair all over the place. It was just a nightmare because, you know, he's curious. Like, don't touch anything when we go in here. Yeah. I always felt awkward about the I clear every cure pair of socks too, in the because house it came fun. in syringes. <laughs> and you're yeah. like, this looks weird. There's just a, a box of syringes on my tying desk. And it's a weird combination you're of chunky, hobbies. Man. Yeah. yeah. Fly time. Yeah. They didn't have needles, though. They didn't have needles. Nope. All right, so I'm going to put this last piece on. So I got that there, and I'm going to fold those both back, and I'm going to do that same trick I just did just to give myself, you can see there's not a lot of room for me to finish that that off, so I'm going to slide it back a little bit. Make some room. Get a couple lashes there, see if it's, see where it stays, see what it does there. Push it back a little more if I need to. And then finish it off. How'd you come up with this color scheme? Um it's it's always I don't know. I don't know. It's just interesting. I I fish a lot more for pike than I do for musky. And you don't always see the the pinks the you know, blended in for pike, and you know the idea is that maybe the pike don't care as much. But look at this thing. Yeah, it's pretty. Mardi slick. Gras is the perfect name for it. <laughs> and Going to Mardi you know, what? There's a certain color of water on Lake St. Clair because on Lake St. Clair, like when you fish with Eric uh, Gryeski, like Lake St. Clair it's featureless almost, right? So it's just this giant flat. So a lot of times the structure you're fishing is the color changes in the water, right? So like you'll see that color line and there's a color of water that when it's like sunny out and it's cloudy, but you can see like this color just freaking glows. And it's just a a really good, like when you see that color of water, you're like, all right, that's, it's time. So I've got, my head taken care of one thing I'll do too, to kind of, I don't want to say conserve materials because I will just, I'll put it back in the pile, but I'll just go through and I'll pull any loose, loose material out. Cause there's going to be some, there's so much there. And then what I do to put the eyes on is I, for this one, I use half inch 3d eyes and I'm going to take that same goop that I used for the popper head. And I'm going to put it on the back of these things. And I use a heavy amount, right? So I put a good dollop of it on there. 
I'm going to set it right in that cavity. And what's, what it's going to do is a couple things. Number one, I like the, the silicone bases for putting on the eyes. Because if you use like a like a regular super glue, a traditional tri super glue, it's very brittle. And when the fly right. gets torqued, it might just pop off, right? Right. This has a little bit of give and a little bit of movement to it. That's going to help out with that. The other thing it's going to do is that silicone, when you push it into these senio fibers, is it's going to hold on to them. So when you're fishing them, you're not going to lose them. Because if you, you know, you talk about steelhead flies, you swing a steelhead fly with senio on the front of it. If you've had it long enough, it's going to wind up not having that stuff on it, right? Right. But this stuff right. holds on to those fibers. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm in total agreement about the glue for eyes. And I think, I think we may even do a video about that coming up soon, just because I've seen so many people use super glue no or, point or the UV, which don't get me started. It, <laughs> but the brittle point is hitting the nail on the head and having that a little bit more flex in your glue. It's, I mean, it, it is amazing how many fish some of these will last even when you're catching hammer handle pike, you know, and they're just swarming the thing. The eyes stay on. That's why, mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't tried the, the goo. Um, I've been, uh, what is it? Fabric. Terramender. Fly fu it's fusion. Uh, something crazy. I don't know. I bought, it's like four ounces. I'm, that's why I don't know what it is. I've, I've bought it once and that's it. I have it somewhere <laughs> in here. I'll find it. That's the beauty of being at the shop, I guess. So. I love those eyes. Those uh, look great. Yeah. Like you, I've got a ton of them and you just can find the one that make the, make the fly pop. Right. I don't know how. Does the. See Eli here. Can't oh, hear did him. I right cut now. out right there again? There you go. There yeah, go. of course. Grand entrance, grand exit. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's it. All right. Again, I like I like scaling it up. I use the a four out hook for the the junior. I use a one out for that for that pot belly. Fantastic. That's awesome. I'm totally going to go shopping for wigs tonight. So <laughs> I'm going to get some wig hair for my flies. I'm going to get a wig to go musky fishing in. It's going to be great. I like where you're going with that, Matt. <laughs> and the cool thing is, you know, we I don't know if everybody, I don't think we talked about it on air. Eli is actually going to be up in the Traverse area next week, yes. which will be really cool. And, uh, Hopefully, hopefully, I don't know. I don't know how much of your time we can we can take advantage of, but we'd love to get you on a podcast or maybe even do Shoot a some more video, do a little video or two for you too. Because, I mean, figure it out. I, I love this stuff. I think the warm water thing growing. Um, you know, just I think it's the future of fly fishing. Really, I do too. Let's yeah. see global warming, warm water. Yes. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Like local right you like you, you it's you you like the, the the story i told in the beginning right at lake st Clair was in my backyard the whole time and i was trying to get away from it why right right like you you, you take what you take what uh oh. you what your area get in Mary. lost me again oh i hear you now there we go okay like cuts out when you when you have something to say, you know. It's it's like a copy <laughs> yeah. machine when you want it to work, right? I grew up in yeah. Indiana, so I feel the same way. I mean, I grew up fishing bass and bluegill uh, with a fly rod, and you know, I still do that all the time. It's so um, much fun. It's so much fun, and I don't want to drive over to the river. A lot of times when I get home from work, uh, I have a million little lakes, and you can go out and chuck some streamers around chuck some poppers and have fun and be the only one and be the only there. one out there for now we're extremely fortunate here in michigan there's so much you know like it's just like okay what do i want to do today okay i have these three options <laughs> right? Like, yeah, right except for right now like you've got plenty of options throughout the year oh Absolutely. it's overwhelming 
the variety. And that's what makes it fun and a challenge. It's not easy here, but it's fun. Cool. I'm going to switch things over here. Cool. I'm going to go to here. I'm going to add Eli in the corner as we sign out. A few things as we as we wrap up with Eli. First of all, if you can, come see us. Go see him at the Michigan Fly Fishing Show. Absolutely. Coming up in March. We're very excited to have it back. We're going to have some big deals on materials, some big deals on clothing, all that stuff. Uh, what's the weekend there, Brian? Midwest so, Fly Fishing Expo, March 12th and 13th. Awesome. So Be there. We'll be there. Uh, and it's just such a cool place, and you can get so much information there. It's amazing. So and we have talented tires like Eli. Yep. So, Eli, we can't thank you enough for yeah, doing this tonight. Big time. Big thanks for Eli. We're big fans of your flies. And, and the uh, link down below, check out his website, greatlakesfly.com, and his Instagram so you can get some more crazy color inspiration. Absolutely. Uh, that's, Buy some flies from him. Yeah. I definitely go to yours and Matt's pages and get some color inspiration once in a while. So, Sure. Cool. We miss anything, Eli? Let's see. Uh, I think we're good. Just uh, right. we'll be in touch. We'll get uh, I'll swing by next week. Awesome. Fantastic. Excited Thank you to so see you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Yeah. Um, you know, another another fun adventure and fly time for a Wednesday night. That's right. It's always an adventure. Always so an adventure. Tune in next week. We got Mike Corson's going to be on. Uh, he's going to be tying some classic inspired streamers. So he's a guy that really likes the history of Northern Michigan fly yes. fishing, and there's yep. so much of it. And he really drives a lot, takes a lot of inspiration from the classics. He's a so, big brook trout, brook trout, brook trout maniac guy. in the best way possible. Absolutely. So. We might have to put a uh, parental warning though on next week. We'll we see. We might so. have to do that. We might have to try and apply him for information on where to fish in the UP. Ooh, you get that's a that's the long the long play, Brian. Uh, I've been working on that for years. I got like <laughs> one spot I have him so far. So, um, Eli, stick around as we wrap up here, and then. Uh, I think uh, Fly Fish and Film Tour. Um, oh, you should probably check out the podcast because we dropped an episode where we finally talk about when Paris Hilton came to the fly shop yes. this past year. Yeah. And Fortunately, I was not here for that. I was in Hoxieville. <laughs> it's probably Listen for the Billy best. Springs. Probably for the best. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. We had to stick you in the back room with, with Casey. Yeah. Like you can hear... Dog. Tune, I mean, check that out. Hear why Casey was stuck in the back office and, uh, you know, how the day went for us. So, All right. We'll see everyone next Wednesday. Same time, same place. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon in the shop or out on the water. See you.